among churches in Christianity that make the Christian religion different from other religions. Uh, different denominations fight and disagree on how to practice some of these things, but all of them have similar things in common, uh, whether it be baptism or tithing or sanctuaries or priests. Uh, we've covered these things, or the Lord's Supper. We've covered some of these doctrines already. Last week we covered priests and the priesthood in Christianity, and whether that's a thing that, that the Bible says we need in this dispensation. And we concluded with not in this dispensation. The Bible describes priests. But uh, today, in the body of Christ, we have a head, and we're all made members of his body. Uh, this week, I'd like to revisit the subject of worship. Another similar element that is common among all Christian churches is this idea of worship. And so, religious worship is defined, uh, if you're studying religion, as church meeting. In fact, the dictionary, I looked it up in the dictionary, what worship meant. One of the first definitions was church meeting. It's like, okay. So worship is the gathering of Christians in, in church, in the church meetings. And if you take it a step further, even to the liturgy. So what is the worship in a lot of churches? It's the liturgy, the planned order of things. You've heard of the, the phrase, the order of worship, things like that. And that has to do with the agenda for how we meet and how we run our meetings. So different denominations have different orders of worship and different degrees of that. But all Christians do worship. Uh, the ceremonies that you have in churches or rituals you have, uh, some more liturgical churches have chants and things like that or things that they repeat over back and forth with each other. Uh, this is all what defines religious worship. In other less liturgical Christian denominations, there's still worship. It's just not as structured, perhaps, or as ceremonial. But even still, maybe you're familiar with the idea of a worship service, that terminology being synonymous with music, with singing, with praise, uh, with a passionate performance to God. And that's the idea of worship service. So many people will talk about the worship service either being the meeting or having a worship service before the teaching and preaching. And so there's teaching and preaching. Before that, you have a worship service, 10, 20, 30, 40 hours sometimes. If the Spirit leads, who knows? Maybe it takes over the preaching and teaching, and that's the worship service. Um, worship leaders, thereby, would be those who are musicians, right? I mean, that, again, I'm just stating to what people see in churches, and then we'll revisit it. A worship leader are those that lead such things. If it's a religious church, then the, well, those who lead worship are usually the priests and whatnot. But uh, in the less liturgical, there's the worship and then the teaching. And so the worship leaders aren't the teachers necessarily. They're usually musicians or those musically minded. That, of course, is not the case here. Uh, I am not very musical in that regard. And the position of music leader is still available after 20 years of ministry. But meanwhile, worship leaders are seen as musicians. And uh, if I might be frank, masters of emotional elicitation. Yeah. Um, the elicitation of emotions from people about God, which is what music is good at doing, by the way. Music is something that elicits emotions from people. That's the point of music. And uh, a, a, lot, a large part of the emotions that it draws has to do with the sounds, the notes, and the tunes, but also the words that are, that are sung and, and, and that sort of thing. And this is what worship leaders are supposed to do, apparently, is to elicit a certain type of emotion from people to change their heart such that sometimes they're prepared to hear the teaching other times such that they just express their emotions to God, and that is what is described as worship service. Uh, a survey about five or six years ago actually found out, as they asked why people choose one church over another, they found that one of the reasons was worship, the praise band, music. And 38% of people said that was a major reason for choosing the church they go to. It was the music, the music style, or the praise band, and, and that type of thing, the worship, as they called it. And so what we see then in Christianity either that, is that church worship has been diminished. And this is yeah. the, the claim I'm going to point out here today. It's been diminished, quite frankly, from what the Bible defines it as. And church worship has been diminished either to the liturgy and ceremony in some churches or to what maybe you're more familiar with, an hour of singing music and hand-waving. Yeah. It's been diminished to that. Now, it's interesting I say diminished because, again, many people have the idea of worship and music and the emotional expression of praise to God which isn't necessarily bad, as being the deepest part of spirituality. Like they think that the teaching and the words and the faith, and these are academic, but the real heart and deep thing that God wants us to bring us to is the emotional expression and the emotions being realized about our relationship with God. And uh, I hope that the Bible will challenge you in that regard as we study through the scripture here about that. It's not that emotions are bad or that praise is even bad. The Bible talks a lot about praising God. And yet at the same time, emotions, as Paul's talking in Romans 6, 7, and 8 about our flesh and about the spirit, emotions 
are not the same thing as the Spirit. Amen. And emotions, rather than being the deep, solid things of God, are actually the airy, light, and fluffy things. Emotions are the whipped cream on top of your pie. I like the whipped cream, but the pie is the substance, right? And that's the idea. Uh, and so you like a nice breeze every now and then. It's, it's wonderful in the fall and spring. It's bitter in the cold. It's dry in the desert. And yet the air is not the same as the ground you stand on, right? And that's the biblical teaching of emotions. Good, but not the ground, yeah. right? And so when people think in our culture now that the expression of emotion is the actual deep spirituality, usually it's because they're missing what is really the truth about spirituality and, and what God's doing. Usually that's the case. And so we need to reverse the thinking. We live in a culture that lives in their flesh, and it affects the church, no doubt, even ourselves, in living after our flesh. And part of that is following our emotions rather than the truth. Yes. So you go to church, if worship then is the singing and the music and the elicitation of emotions, that is the substantial part of it. You put up with the teaching for a little bit, you know, but the, the worship is really what you're trying to, to get out of you, to change your heart about things, okay? Um, making worship musical performance, making it the church meeting, has made the biblical definition of worship diminished and superficial. Yeah. That's what it's doing. It's a very superficial explanation of it. So when you hear the word worship, if you think music, that's what you think. And, and I confess, that's my tradition as well. It's like, that's what's there. Worship music, right? If that's what you think, you testify to the problem that exists. Okay, you're testifying in your own self to the problem that we have as Christians of valuing things properly. Because this is what worship concerns, truly, is how you value things, what worth you give things. The word worship itself has the etymology of worth, right? And so how you value and give worth to things. And when we think that worship is simply, merely, even though we think it's deep, the musical and emotional expression towards God, that is not the extent of the worth of God. Right, and so it doesn't define biblical worship. So what we're going to do is, is, uh, is to revisit church worship, understanding the Bible dispensationally and rightly divided. What does the Bible say, believing every word in it? What does it say in the context of what goes, God's doing today? How was it defined before in Israel and in time past? And how does it work today? How does God want us to worship him? And what is true worship if it's not music? Really, I mean, can you actually worship God without music, without singing, without praise? Can you worship God without <laughs> praise? And so this is something we're, we're hoping to challenge you this morning with. Um, so let's cover worship in the Bible. Uh, it might surprise you, by the way, maybe it won't, for those of you who read books and read the scripture, that there's not a single tune inspired by God in the Bible. Not a single tune. There are songs. There are psalms. I mean, Solomon has said he wrote over a thousand songs. One of them, the Song of Solomon, is there. You have many psalms written by David and others in the scripture. You have the song of Moses over there. There's many things that are sung. There's instructions to sing. Colossians 3 tells you to sing and, and teach and admonish. David talks about the, the, the rejoicing as in singing. So he says, I will sing. God even says, or uh, Jeremiah says in Lamentations, that God is our music. He is the music. And so it, it talks about God in reference to the beauty and the things that music entails. Uh, and yet there's not a single melody tune a system of notes in the Bible that God says, this is the notes you shall sing when you sing these words. It's interesting because we have an entire book, the Psalms, which is like songs, psalms, and yet no one knows what they sound like. And so throughout history, people have been creating different tunes to them, and why not? And they do that, and uh, putting verses of the Bible to music, and there's nothing wrong with that. But one of my point is there's nothing inspired in the scripture about the melody. And I think it speaks to something because what's more important to God than the tune and the melody is what you're singing, right? The Psalms have words. So if you change the words to be something different or contradictory to the Bible and you start singing the most beautiful melody and wrong words, not good. Even if your intent is to praise God with it, not good, right? One of the reasons why we've rewritten some of the words in our hymnal is so that we can sing with passion and emotion and love toward God, with right doctrine and right words. There's not a single tune inspired in the Bible. Uh, the Psalms has a lot of times where David says, I will sing. And in fact, people get confused with the, the, the word worship and the word praise. We're talking about worship this morning. And the fact that worship means music to people means they're conflating a lot of things. The word praise has more to do with what people think as worship. 
Praise in the Bible is often associated with the uttering of things and the singing of things. When in Psalms, David writes, I will sing, and that phrase shows up in Psalms many times, He's, he often says, I will sing praises. I will sing praises. Never once does it say, I will sing worship. <laughs> it's, I will sing praises. And so, and that's a good thing to sing, praises to God. Right? Hymns, uh, the idea of a hymn is described as a praise to God or about God, uplifting God, and that's what it is. In fact, the, the Psalms uses the word praise more than any other book of the Bible. It should not be surprising to you. Over 188 times the word praise shows up in the Psalms. Uh, interestingly, the chapter that has the most mentions of the word is the final chapter, Psalm 150, um, which if you know the doctrine has to do with the kingdom, but there's 13 mentions of the word praise in Psalm 150. You say, so what? There's only six verses. <laughs> That's a lot of mentions in only six verses. And so uh, Psalms has a lot to do with praising God. Praise ye the Lord, praise ye the Lord is all over the Psalms, and it mentions how to do that. But the word worship, it might surprise you, is found more, most frequently in the Bible, that word, in Revelation. You know, what? I mean, Psalms is worship, right? Psalms are praises to God. There's a lot of doctrine in the Psalms, actually. There's some Psalms that don't sound like a praise at all. Some Psalms sound like a lamenting cry from David. Some Psalms sound very cursing towards his enemies. But the Psalms are to be sung, they were to be sung, and often they include praises. But worship, that word is sh shows up more often in Revelation. You get the 24 elders worshiping God quite a few times there. You get the world being called upon to worship God. And when Christ returns, there's a worship towards God. And so you'll see why that is the case and why that's appropriate as we define what worship is because Revelation is when Christ returns and his kingdom is set up. And that's when the world and everyone will truly worship God. And we're not talking about just a sing-along. Like, that's not, that's not it. We're talking about true worship and what that looks like, okay? And so God, when we say worship is just music, we're saying that God is worth our greatest music, our greatest performance. We get the greatest singers up front, and let's worship God, put the mics on them, everyone else get turned down or just don't sing at all, you know? Uh, hopefully, by teaching the, the biblical idea of worship this morning, it'll help comfort and encourage most of you, and I say most of you because that's the truth of it, most of you who don't like to sing too much. Can I get an amen on anybody? No? Yeah. Like, I sing every meeting, right? But, you know, the, 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 come on, guys. I'm guys, yes, more guys than men. Don't like to sing. Maybe they're not good at it. Usually guys don't like to sing because they're not good at things, but they, they'll do that. But th there's also just uh, the, the idea of the public performance, Right? If worship requires you to sing a public performance, then a lot of Christians are failing, yes? And they're, they're worshiping by proxy, by sitting and listening to those people sing and perform, yeah? In fact, a lot of contemporary worship, which is a lot of performance, quite frankly, when they have the, I still understand why, they have the, the eight to 10 people singing on microphones together, but maybe it's to represent the crowd, I don't know. They call them up there, and they're all singing, and a lot of times in these bigger churches, people aren't singing. Sometimes they are. Sometimes the whole crowd comes together, they turn off the music and they sing, but a lot of times it's their singing and everyone else, because of the sound of the speakers, just they, they can't hear much. and they, They're just not able to. But my point simply being that if worship is simply our greatest music, our greatest performers, it really excludes a lot of us from doing it yes. and also excludes a lot of what we do from it. And it actually diminishes the worth of God to simply say he's worth our greatest music. Of course, you know, people even sing about it, he's worth a lot more than that. Well, if that's true, then what's worship? It's a lot more than music, Amen. right? It's a lot more than that. And so it's a lot more than just the concerts and the songs. He's worth that and what? And everything else, yes? He's worth all of our lives and praise. He's worth more than anything, but that's the idea of worship. So I want to cover a few things in the Bible here about what it says about worship. Look at Genesis 22. The very first time the word worship shows up, some of you are aware of this, some of you are not perhaps. The first time the word worship shows up in the Bible is in Genesis 22. And it should not be surprising, at least after you've heard me give this little spiel about music, that Abraham is not singing as he worships God. Genesis 22, verse 5. This is Genesis 22 is where God told Abraham in verse 1 to take his only son, Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee to the land of Moriah, Mount Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering. God just told Abraham to take the son that I promised you'd have, that God intervened miraculously for his wife to have, and that now has grown up a little bit. It says, take that son, the one I told you is promised, and go to the mountain and offer him to me. I think it's a sacrifice. 
Now, not only is this kind of against our natural instincts, it's like, well, that's kind of strange, and, you know, what kind of God would even require this? Remember at the end of the story, God did not require the death of his son. He would end up requiring the death of his own son. And that's yeah. what it types and shadows. This, his son was saved, Isaac was. But in Genesis 22, he tells him to do this. But notice what Abraham says as he rises up in the morning and, and he, uh, he, he takes uh, Isaac and he takes some servants over there with him. Verse 5, he says, he said unto his young men, Abide ye here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again unto you. He says, me and Isaac... They're at the foot of the mountain. He says, you guys stay here. Me and Isaac are going to go up to the mountain. We're going to worship. Now, sometimes people read that and they go, oh, he must have been uh, just kind of spinning a tail there, like giving a positive spin. We're going to go worship. I'm not going to tell you I'm going to sacrifice my son. No, I don't think he's like deceiving anybody here. I, I think he's actually saying what he's, he's going to do, right? And also, he's not going up there to have a sing-along with Isaac, Amen. right? That's what he's doing. He's not going to praise God with song, okay? He go, he's going up there to sacrifice his son. What's this have to do with worship? This, this exhibits the very first mention of worship, that worship has to do with obedience. Okay, and if, if there's anything in the Bible that testifies someone's obedience to a command that's difficult, it's got to be this thing right here. There's lots of commands God gave Israel, but this, sacrifice your only son, like that, I, that's got to be really difficult, yeah. right? And, and so the obedience that Abram testifies, in fact, that's what happens when Abraham goes up there to offer his son, and then God stops him, offers the ram. Like, while well, that testified, God himself said, I know that you believe because you obeyed, because you did what I said. This whole story depicts obedience. Amen. So Abraham says, I'll go up here to worship. And God says, you want them to obey. Worship is obedience, folks. But you see, if worship is obedience, that's different than saying worship is music. Yeah. Okay. Worship is obedience. That means you can worship without music. Well, that's, that's pretty good. Worship is obedience. Look at Revelation chapter 4. We're in Genesis. Go to the other side of the Bible. From beginning to end, you see this definition of worship, this idea associated with it. Revelation 4.10 is a beautiful passage describing worship, and this is in heavenly places. Okay, this is in heaven, in God's temple up there in heaven. Revelation 4 verse 10. We won't get into the details of what's going on in Revelation 4. I'm trying to here define the word worship in the Bible. We saw it in Genesis 22 associated with word, obedience. And here the same thing in verse 10, chapter 4 in Revelation. He says, The four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that lives forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are were created. So, see that word worship in verse 10? It's describing, it says these, these 24 hours are worshiping God. And it's describing what they're doing. And nowhere in these two verses it says they're singing, leading a chorus or anything like that. It says the closest is that they're saying. Yeah. But be careful of those two things. The Bible knows how to say sing, right? And uh, even though you might like to think the angels were singing to the shepherds in the flock when they were watching their flock by night, it says in the Bible they, they said to them. Um, it, would I be disappointed if they say no? I mean, singing's awesome, especially angelic singing, I would guess. But it says they said this, which again is different because if, even if you can't sing very well, you can say things, can't you? Like, yeah, that's what happens. Revelation 4 verse 10, look what they're doing here, though. First, they fall down. 24 elders fall down before him. Okay, it's kind of hard to sing with your face on the ground, right? Just pointing that out. But they fell down, that's point number one, and that speaks to humility and subjection and that sort of thing. And then it says they, they, they cast their crowns before the throne. The crowns were theirs. They gave them up. So in this worship of God, they fell down before him and gave him what apparently was their glory. Gave it to them, right? And then it, they said, verse 11, thou art worthy. Worthy of what? Falling down before you and giving you our glory. You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For thou hast created all things, and for your pleasure, thy pleasure, they are and were created. These people are saying, these, these elders are saying, you're worthy, your will to be done. Your will, what you want to happen is worth it. Yeah. They've got crowns, they've got authority, and they're going, it's yours because you're worthy of all of it. And for your pleasure, whatever you, pleases you is what should be done. So how do we see worship here? Falling down, giving things up that, that are glory. The Lord is worthy, right, and his will be done. These things, they're, they're characterizing the worship of these 24 elders to God. And which should also characterize worship, generally speaking, right? That's a lot more than just singing praises, right? Yes, we give up songs, right? Some people 
in worship singing will fall down, but those are the people in the front, and they're kind of, a, you know, they're kind of outward that way anyway. But a lot of us don't feel like falling down. We said, that's the problem. Your heart's not in it. You don't have the true heart of worship, you know. If you did, you'd all be on your face flat. Well, worship is just more than that, right? It's, it's something else as we're saying. Worship is obedience. Worship is also subjection. Look at Mark chapter 5. We see this in the idea of falling down, which we saw by the elders in Revelation. Now, notice how I am not indicating the dispensational context of any passage here, and that's because I'm trying to define a word from the Scripture, and I'm taking it all of them. But you need to know the dispensational context. If you're going to take any of these as instruction, you've got to know whether these are instructions for you or not. That's, that matters. But look at Mark chapter 5. We're just trying to find out what the Bible says about worship. This is a good way to study. Look up where the Bible mentions the word and the concept. Then you rightly divide them. Mark 5, verse 6. We'll see up in verse uh, 2 and 3. There's this, this man with an unclean spirit in verse 3 who had his dwelling among the tombs. No man could bind him. No, not with chains. He had an unclean spirit. He had devils in him, right? And in verse 4, he had been bound with fetters and cha uh, chains. And the chains had been plucked asunder by him. Verse 5, and always night and day he was in the mountains and in the tombs crying and cutting himself with stones. Verse 6, but when he saw Jesus, devil-possessed person here. When he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and worshipped him. We got worship going on here. And what didn't happen is he saw Jesus and came up and started saying, rejoice to the Lord always. You know, I'm sure that didn't happen. Instead, he says, he cried with a loud voice and said, what have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou son of the most high God? He worshipped him and said, I adjure thee by God that thou torment me not. This is not the man speaking. This is the unclean spirit speaking Amen. to Jesus saying, I know who you are. You're the son of the most high God. You know, don't torment me. Elsewhere it says, don't torment me before the time, right? It's like begging him. But this is worship? Yeah. And you know Why? Because this devil, this unclean spirit, is subject to, he knows he's subject to this son of man, of the most high God. There's no power higher than who he represents, the son of God. And so he runs to him and worships by saying, please don't torment us. He's subject. The devils can worship? If worship means to be subject, the devils will be. The devils don't obey, so they don't worship that way. That's for sure. But you see here that Mark 5, 6, 7, this idea of subjection is associated with the word worship in the Bible. Look in 1 Corinthians 14, 25. You see it again here, only this is not a devil. This is going to be a believer, someone that comes to believe. In 1 Corinthians 14, 25. Worship is more than just expressed love. Worship is more than just musical performance. And music, worship is more than just praise though it may include those things. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 25. Thus are the secrets of his heart. Here's talking about prophecy and the gift of prophecy among early church members and how they could prophesy and how he's making the point that prophecy is better than tongue talking because tongue talking can confuse people. They don't know what you're saying. So unless you have an interpreter, you know, tongues are, are less useful. than prophecy, which can communicate truth to people. And prophecy was used to communicate truth to people. And particularly, if you're dealing with one person, truth about them, such that verse 25 would happen. Okay, verse 24 says, If all prophecy, and there come in one that believes not, or one unlearned, so we got an unbeliever here, an ignorant person, he is convinced of all, he is judged of all. How does he get convinced by the prophet? Thus are the secrets of his heart may manifest. So the prophet says something that only he would know, that someone else doesn't know, and thus it says, So falling down on his face, he will worship God, and report that God is in you of a truth. He was an unbeliever until he heard something only God could, could know tell him this, and then what, he, what does he do in response? He worships God. Yes. But associated with that is the falling down on his face. He's not singing a song here. He's falling down on his face in subjection to the truth of the God that's working in this prophet that just told me something only God can know. Like he goes from unbelief and rebellion to that's God. And I'm subject to him. Falling down in humility. Right? That's the principle here. The prostration. That word prostration. Uh, which is a very bad way to sing. But it's a good way to be subject. And that's what worship entails in 1 Corinthians 14. In fact, this is the, the idea of Job's worship. Look at Job chapter 1. This is a very popular passage regarding worship. A very, might I say, touching or impactful 
verse on worship because these verses of Job worshiping God happen right after everything was taken away from Job. So we've already gotten past the point where Satan and God talked their talk, and then after the devil's taken away all of his children and all of his wealth and all this business. Job 1, verse 20, this is what Job responds to the man, the messenger who said, I only am escaped alone to tell thee. The only thing left from Job's wealth and property and possessions, including people, was this messenger just to tell him that he lost everything. <laughs> that was it. And Job 1, verse 20, Then Job arose, rent his mantle, shaved his head, fell down upon the ground, and worshipped. And it's not indicating here that he started singing praises to God. Okay, it says in verse 21, He said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb, naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, the Lord had taken away. And I just don't like that or don't understand that I'm confused by that. No, he says, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Amen. Right? You see, the attitude here, it's not him singing. It's the attitude of Job saying, I've lost it all. And you know what? God is worthy. He gave it. He takes it away. That's why Job was called an upright man, folks. Because most of us, if everything was taken away from you, you, you first go, God, why? And Job knows from the very beginning of the book of Job, he hasn't yet got to the point where God talks to him, but he already knows that that really wasn't mine to begin with. I loved it, I wanted it, I liked it, I was have, it was great, I was serving God, but God gives and God takes away. People wonder why in the Bible God can kill people, which he does, especially to his enemies, and the answer is because God gave life, he can take it away. He's the only one that can take away life because he's the only one that gave life. Life is his. People don't respect that. People think, especially unbelievers, that it's my life. Where'd you get it? Your parents, immediately, but indirectly from God. God gave yeah. life. And Job here said, blessed be the name of the Lord. So this idea of worship as subjection. He, he by the way, he, he rips his clothes and shaves his beard as a sign of humility, folks. Uh, it's humility. And so what he's doing here is saying, I am low, obviously. My circumstances are low, and I'm making myself low because God is to be praised. God is worthy. He's blessed, right? And so that, that's Job's response. Psalm 95 has, is one of popular passages on worship as well, and it talks about let us kneel down, let us bow down before the Lord and worship. Let's kneel down and bow down. So worship has to do with kneeling and bowing. What's that mean, kneeling and bowing? That's subjection. Yes. That's the idea of saying, I am serving you. Right? And so every, that's the idea that everyone serves something, even it's themselves. Yes. It's the idea of bowing down to God is to say, I serve God. To say, Job, if Job served himself or his wealth, he would not have said what he said. Instead, he serves God, and he falls down, worshiping him, saying, I'm subject to him. Yes. Right? Look at 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 4. This idea of subjection, of, of making yourself lower than something else, is, is, is included in this heart of worship here. In 2 Thessalonians 2, Thessalonians 2, verse 4. This is talking about the Antichrist. What a weird place to find a verse about worship. But we're trying to define the word from the biblical, the biblical use of it. And here's the Antichrist, Thessalonians 2, verse 4, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he, as God, sits in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Blasphemer, liar, right? Wrong. Okay, he's not God. But see the word worship there? He exalts himself above all that is called God and that is worshipped. What's it mean to worship? Well, you worship God. You worship that which is above all. He's exalting himself above all that is worshipped, which means he is the pinnacle of all worthy worship in his eyes, right? So worship has something to do with subjection or the, the, the recognizing of things that are high up, yeah. higher than you, right? This is this idea of worship. You can go actually to Revelation 13 and you see the Antichrist there again who exalts himself and he, people bow down and worship the beast, Remember Revelation 13? What are they doing? They're exalting him up. He is worth more than the rest of us, and he is God, or he's the son of God. They're exalting the wrong guy, the wrong thing, but they're exalting something up. Worship has to do with exalting something up. And what I'm trying to point out here is you, ex that exaltation isn't only what happens when you praise. You can, pray, you can exalt God by praise, but there's also the exaltation in your subjection to someone. You can say all you want in praise. If you don't actually obey and subject yourself to the will of God, what are you doing? You see what I'm saying? 
You can't say you're worshiping God if you just say, oh God, you're above all, you control everything in my life, and then you make all the choices and you serve yourself. Like that, that's vanity. That's why that diminishes worship to say worship is only music and singing, because anyone can say anything. Worship is about what you do and what you think about who you are and who God is. And it's how you think about the worthiness of God. That's worship. Right? And so Revelation 13 talks about uh, that. Revelation 13 verse 4, it, it says there the, the, the beast will say, there are people who will say about the beast and they worship him, who is like unto him? Who is like unto the beast? Remember that verse in Revelation 13? Who is like unto him? And no one can, can beat him in, in war, right? Well, that phrase, who is like unto the beast, is actually a mock of God because that's the same thing in Exodus 15, 11 that Moses and Israel sang when God delivered them from the Egyptians. They said, who is like unto God? Who can defeat him in battle? And the, Antichrist is, the, the worship of the Antichrist is the same thing in Revelation 13. So they're, they're saying the same praise as the Bible worshipers in Exodus 15, only there it's about the wrong God. It's the wrong, 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 wrong one. So you see that phrase in Psalm 71, Psalm 113 as well. Who is like unto God? Who is worthy of him? Answer, no one. Nothing. Amen. Well, if he's above all and he's worth all things and everything is subject to him, that's what constitutes worship, is when you acknowledge this and recognize this and operate according to this. So Revelation 14, verse 7, actually talks about this idea of worshiping God, where there's two times in Revelation where John bows down to the angel, the messenger, just because of the glorious things that they show him. And so he bows down, and twice the, the messenger goes, stand up. He says, I, I'm a messenger. I'm, I'm like you. He says, worship God, is what they tell him. Revelation 14, this tells us something about worship as subjection. Revelation 14, 7, saying with a loud voice, fear God, give glory to him. This is talking about the everlasting gospel. Here, here, these, this angels flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel in verse 6. And they said in this everlasting gospel they were preaching, Fear God, give glory to him, the hour of his judgment is come, and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. What's the everlasting gospel? Fear God, give glory to him, worship him. Well, if worship were singing, then apparently God's ultimate goal in gospel is for everyone to sing for him. And their churches actually think that. They think that, like, this is what God ultimately wants, everyone to sing to him. Right? What? It says here, fear him, give glory to him, his judgment has come, subject yourself to him. He is going to reign over all. If you don't subject yourself to him, he will destroy you. Because <laughs> who is like unto God? This is the everlasting gospel. This is the, the truth throughout the ages. We should always know that God is higher and we are not. Verse 8, there followed another angel saying, Babylon has fallen, the great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. The third angel followed. And said, if any man worship the beast in his image and receive his mark on his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink at the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture in the cup of indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels, in the presence of the Lamb, and the smoke of the torment sends up forever. Why, why is this description here? The gospel was worship God. You do that, you be saved, you get life. If you worship the beast, problems. I mean, that's why it was so detailed there. Like, the good news is worship God. The bad news is, you don't want that, and it's going to happen real soon here. The judge is coming. But worship has to do with subjection, you see here in the context. Revelation 22, verse 8. Revelation 22, verse 8. I, John, saw these things and heard them, and when I heard and seen, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel which showed me. So you see, when he, he wants to worship the angel, he's not singing a song to him. He falls down to his feet. He's saying, I'm subject to you, O holy angel who delivered these things to me, who showed these things to me. And then the angel said unto him, do it not, don't do that. I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren the prophets, and of them which keep the sayings of this book. I'm just one subject to my master as well, my master being the Lord God. He says, worship God. In verse 9, you see that? So what's worship? Bowing down to the right being. <laughs> Knowing who God is. Doing what he says, that's worship. It's interesting. It's a little different than the superficial version of worship is the music we sing before the teaching. That's like, more than just singing. Acts 10, verse 25, the same thing happened to Peter. Remember Peter, Peter went to Cornelius? Cornelius came to Peter, and because Cornelius had prayed to God, and God actually answered his prayer and sent Peter, like the apostle Peter, 
to Cornelius. I mean, what a privilege and an honor. And so no, no, Cornelius is like, oh, thank you, Holy Peter, for being here. And you're the apostle. You saw Jesus. You were there. You're at Pentecost. You preach. He bows down to Peter. What does Peter say? Stand up. I'm a man, right? I'm not God. Worship God, right? Amen. Cornelius tried to worship Peter. He rejected it because you worship God. This is why the fact that Jesus received worship, the fact that after Jesus rose from the dead, Luke, it says that the disciples worshiped him when he went to heaven. And that wasn't with a sing-along. That was them saying, wow, he's God. <laughs> he, he, I just saw him go to heaven, like, visibly. Like, that's God, right? That's worship. When Thomas said, my Lord, my God, that's worship. Yes. He just said it. I don't know what the melody, I'm sure he wasn't singing along to something. He just said it. He recognized it. He acknowledged it. He, he subjected himself to the holy God, and that was worship. Can you do that with singing? Yes, you can. Need you do that with everything else? Yes, you should. Right? It's much more than that. So worship is subjection, it's obedience. Worship is, as you boil it down here, service. Look at Matthew 4, verse 7 and 8. Matthew 4. Remember the temptations that Jesus went through with the devil? Remember the one where the devil asked him to worship him? I, I don't think. Maybe I'm being facetious here. I really don't think Satan's wanting Jesus to sing him a love song. No. Right? <laughs> like, a lot of songs about you, Jesus. Just sing one about me, you know. Matthew 4, verse 7, Jesus said unto the devil, it is written, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. And the devil takes him up to an exceeding high mountain, shows him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. So you see here, this is, this is powerful stuff. I mean, this is the kingdoms of the world that the devil says he has charge of. That's power. That's glory. That's an elevated high thing. Now, those weren't given to him by God, by the way. He usurped them, but he's showing the kingdoms of the world, and he says, all these things will I give unto you. Now, folks, you know, it's, it's hard for people just to buy a car, get a down payment on a house, let alone a whole kingdom. And so when the devil says to Jesus, I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world, someone comes to you and says, Ev not just this country and that company, but every state, every country, every city, all wealth in the world, I give to you. That's a high worth. The devil is saying, Jesus, I'm giving, you're worthy of all this stuff here. I'll give it all to you, Jesus. What's the condition? You worship me. You fall down at my feet and worship me. You will be above everything except me. Worship me. Satan isn't saying, I want a love song. I want you to sing a song. I want you to praise me. He says, you'll be subject to me. You'll serve me. You'll have everything in the world in service to me. And of course, Jesus responds in holiness here. Get the hint, Satan, for it is written, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him alone shalt thou serve. What did Jesus say? He didn't say, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, to him alone shalt thou sing. I know I'm hounding singers. I'm not trying to hurt singing. I'm just saying, I'm trying to disrupt the tradition that people think about it. Superficiality, it's deeper than that. Thou shalt serve. Worship is service. That's what it is, okay? Romans chapter 1, verse 25, Paul said the same thing. Look at Romans 1, 25, about worship being service. He's talking here about in the beginning of the creation and how men became fools and they were sinners and they were without excuse and they changed the glory, in verse 23, of the uncorruptible God into an image like a corruptible man. The problem with doing that is simply because they're diminishing the worth and glory of God, right? But verse 24, it says, God gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies. Verse 25, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator. Now, God told man to have dominion on the earth. He told man to serve one another, right? What's wrong with serving created things if you serve it more than the creator? You worship and serve the creature more than the creator. This is the problem. Now you've got the value system wrong, right? Like God has to be here, everybody else here. And when they start serving this more than God, that's a problem with your worship. See, that, that we're trying to find worship here. We think about, when Christians talk about service, they know what, the, oh yeah, serve, we serve God. But they... Serving God, they think, is different than worship, which is music to God. And I'm saying, that, no, the worship is the service. Amen. It's not a meeting. It's not like the song. It's, it's your service to the Lord. Yes. You can't worship God unless you serve him above everything else. Now, thank God he doesn't save us by our worship. <laughs> right? 
You're saved by grace and dispensation, which is not by your performance, musically or not. It's not by your service or not. Salvation's not service, and thank God for that. It's by grace today. Because if salvation were by worship, and Justin, if you're saying that we don't truly worship unless you truly serve God, then who can be saved? Salvation is not by worship. Salvation is by Christ's finished work Amen. and by his grace. But worship is something we ought to give God, and it's something that we should express in our life, but it concerns our service, which is why it's at the same time more common to be able to do worship and much harder to do worship than what Christians have made it. They've excluded worship to those that can in a certain place and also simplified it to just being praise, right? Worship is your service to God. That's what it is. My wife is not from this side of the planet. You know that. And one of the things you learn when you, and it's a cliche that some of you know already, but the, the, the way that people in the West express love and the way people in the East express love are very different. Uh, when I went over there, often they, there would be comments made about my emotions and my passion being an American. And if you know me, you're like, well, Justin? Like, he, he, he's not that outward. I mean, I'm kind of an introvert, you know. But they, it, all Westerners have this commonality that we love to say things and hug things and touch things and express emotion. Like, that's how we do it. If you love someone, you give them a hug. If you love someone, you say, I love you. Well, you know, they don't do that in some parts of the world, like, as easily as we do over here. Okay, and in the East, and my wife, as she grew up in her family, it may shock some of you, they never said I love you in their family. You say, what a terrible, corrupt, evil, wicked family. Their idea of love was service to one another. They did things. They cooked for each other. They cleaned for each other. They provided things. They did things. And that was the expression. That's a cultural thing. Yeah. You know, it's service more than just the words. And we, we sometimes sing songs about that, being more than words and all that, you know, but we really are doing that with words. So, uh, we really love the words over here. And both, of course, are necessary. But really, the heart of love is past the words. It yeah. is service. If you say you love someone and don't do anything to show it, we know that's hypocrisy and fake. We know that. We're just more open with saying it, perhaps. But this is what I'm trying to get to regarding service, is that worship, saying you love God, saying praises to God, is good and fine. But if there's nothing you're doing to obey and serve God, there is no worship. Like, there's nothing there. Okay? And so we need to ask ourselves how to do that. Song of Solomon when he speaks about the heart of service, he says, if a man would give all of his possessions for love, then truly all of his possessions would be contempt. They'd be destroyed. As soon as you're talking about love between a man and a woman, that sort of thing. And when a, when a, when a man loves a woman, who's that? Uh, who's that? Michael Bolton or something, right? Uh, everything. He'll give away everything for it, right? That, that, that's what it's saying because of the power of love. It's another song. Man, it's songs, really. Well, love is just everywhere. But wor worship is service. Love at the heart of it is service as well. It used to be said in uh, the Anglican Book of Prayer, I know it's archaic now, but the Anglican Book of Prayer, in the wedding vows, that the husband actually would say to the wife, with my body, I thee worship. And uh, this, is, again, is the front, whoa, whoa, worship God, buddy, you know. But the idea there was that I hold you in higher esteem and worth. I'm going to serve you with my body. And in fact, specifically with this woman, more than anyone else in the whole world, I'm going to serve you right, with my body. And that was the idea, it was the promise. Im implicit in the whole wedding ceremony was that we all serve God, he's above all. But this woman, I chose this wife, I want to serve her above all. It's putting her above the other women, right? And that was this idea of worship, of service, okay? So how can we define worship in the Bible then? Well, it's service to what is of the highest worth. Yeah. It's worship to God, that's, that's simply put what it is. It's service to what is the highest worth. That's what it is. So when you're serving that which is of the highest worth, who that is and what he wants done and what he's doing, that's worship. Amen. Okay? That's why words, like in the parenthesis here, are associated with worship. Adoration, which has to do with your affection and love, are associated with worship. Because adoration isn't just love. It's, it's love to the highest degree you adore, right? And it's veneration or reverence, which is respect, but not just like you respect each other, but respect to the highest degree. It's like that, though, that who deserves the most respect, uh, honor and praise. Praise is another thing. Praise is exalting up someone, right, with words. And praise is like exalting someone a lot, and that's what you're doing with God. You're saying he is the highest worth, and I'm going to serve him. 
Submission is kind of the corollary to that. If you're saying God is the highest worth, then that means, what about yourself? I'm less than him. And in fact, you might say, I'm going to submit to everything he says. There's nothing God says that I will not submit to. Like, that's the corollary to worship, right? Or devotion. Like, I devote my whole existence to the one who gave it to me, right? That's what worship sounds like. It doesn't require a melody, you see? True worship requires us to value things properly. That's why when you learn the Bible and read the scripture and learn what God is doing, it changes your priorities because you're learning to value things properly. You're learning how to worship God. That's what's going on. It requires humility because you can't boast in yourself before a holy God. It requires judgment to discern different things, whether it's worth it or not. The word worship has to do with worth. So we need to be experts at valuing different things. Which one's good or better? Which one's right or wrong? Which one's higher or lower? Which one's serve more or which one should be honored more? Right? We should be experts at doing this because we know the one who is above all and he's the one that gives his will and wisdom about how we should value things. That's what worship is. Church worship then is church service. But I don't mean the meeting. I don't mean we come to service this morning. It's what the church values most. That's what it is. It's the way you, as the church, you're members of the body of Christ, the way you serve the Lord, which means what you value most. You say, well, God. Yeah, okay. God who? Well, God in Jesus Christ. How? According to Revelation of the Mystery. Like, what's that mean? Well, the grace of God. Like, I'm going to live by that, walk by that. That's what God values most. I'm going to value that most. I'm going to serve that. Amen. That's what church worship is. So I want to go through the remainder of the time here, just a comparison between Worship under the law system and dispensationally, and, and, and worship today in this dispensation to show you the contrast a little bit, because worship all throughout the Bible is serving, serving uh, that which is the highest worth, which is God. And so if God, recognizing who the true God is, tells you to do something, someone who wants to worship him will do it, right? A man of faith will do it. A man who adores him will do it. The one who wants to honor him will do it. But under the law, is a different type of instruction that God gave. This one who's worthy of all worship God gave specific instructions under the law and how to worship him. Look at 1 Chronicles 15. Under the law, David appointed singers and musicians in the temple. Aha, there you go. Worship is singing. Well, I'm not saying it's a void of singing and music. I'm simply saying it's not only that. Many people make the mistake of thinking. If you're not worshiping God, if you don't see worship as happening more outside of the singing of songs than in them, you've got the value wrong. You've misunderstood what it is. Just like if you think you serve God here more than you do the other six days of the week, then something's an issue with your service, right? Like this has been taught ad nauseum. But First Chronicles 15, verse 16. Here's David under the law. He spake to the chief of the Levites. Remember we covered last week the priesthood under Israel's law were the Levitical tribe. There were priests, and those priests uh, required, were required for forgiveness of sins and the function of all the holy instruments in the holy place and the sanctuary and the temple there. They were also, as I mentioned last week, also used for the leading of Israel's worship. The priests were the worship leaders in Israel's nation. And by that I mean they're the ones who are responsible for teaching the law of God what people should do, how they should live, what sacrifices they should offer, how they receive atonement and forgiveness, and yes, how they should praise God. And so verse 15, verse 16, David appoints the chief of the Levites to appoint their brethren to be the singers with instruments of music, psalteries and harps and cymbals. When was the last time you had a praise band with a psaltery, right? Well, it's actually not too far off. If you, if you Google psaltery, uh, people don't know exactly what it is, but it's some sort of stringed instrument. It's pretty close to a guitar. I don't know. But, you know, also the pianos uh, usually have strings in them, that sort of thing. Uh, people, worship majors, love to emphasize those types of things, you know. But um, they had psalteries and they had harps and they had cymbals. And, and down in verse uh, 17 or 16, it says, they sounded by lifting up the voice with joy. So they're, they're praising and singing here. So the Levites appointed He-Man, the son of Joel, and of his brethren, Asaph, and some of these names you're familiar with from the Psalms. And if you drop down to verse 22, it says, especially Kenaniah, chief of the Levites, he was for song. He instructed about the song because he was skillful in song. So these are some worship leaders who have skill in the performing of songs among the Levites. I'm pretty sure when David, by God, appointed these people, he wasn't randomly drawing names. <laughs> Like Kenaniah, who was skillful. God knew that. He knew that. 
and thus the justification that people have for, well, we, in our holy sanctuary, we need to have people appointed up in the holy place on the stage to do. Well, is this what God wants us to do in 1 Chronicles 15 is the question there. But this did happen there. 1 Chronicles 25, verse 7. 25, verse 7. By the way, leading of the song and the singing there and those instruments were exclusive to the priests. This wasn't an instruction to everyone in Israel. It was for the priests. 25, verse 7. The number of them with their brethren that were instructed in the songs of the Lord, even all that were cunning, was 204 score and eight, which is 288. That was the size of their choir, 288 people. You say, wow, what a choir. Yeah, okay. Uh, you can find places in the Bible talking about music, uh, but is it talking about their worship? That's what we're trying to get to. Look at 2 Chronicles chapter 5. Second Chronicles 5, verse 13. You ever heard of a glory cloud? I've got to bring up glory cloud in context of worship because, you know, some churches today are trying to pray and sing that glory cloud down. And uh, it's amazing how people, when they worship, sometimes it's in bigger congregations, they'll even inject things that look cloudy into the environment uh, to try to produce a similar effect. Um, as Second Chronicles 15, uh, chapter 5 actually is, is where it originates. Uh, but verse 13, it came to pass, as the trumpeters and the singers were as one, they were all singing together, they made one sound to be heard, this is like harmony, right? Made one sound to be heard in praising and thanking the Lord, and when they lifted up their voice with the trumpets and cymbals and instruments, this is the praise band, and praise the Lord. Notice, by the way, my definition before that praise had to do more with music than worship. We're seeing that consistent here, okay? It's using what praise. Praise is a thing. Talk about worship, which is related but separate. But it says, when they were praising the Lord here, saying, for he is good, his mercy endures forever. That's a praise and a worshipful thing to say. His mercy endures forever, that then the house was filled with a cloud, even the house of the Lord, so that the priests could not stand to minister by reason of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord had filled the house of God. Wow. They sang with one, with the trumpets and the cymbals, and they were praising God such that God's glory cloud came into the house, and the ministers couldn't even minister because we're just... Worship isn't used. They're praising. They say, wow, what a pattern. That's what we need in our churches today. We need people with one voice singing in harmony, praising God so that he comes down. What do you know doctrinally? No, you're not. You're the temple of the Holy Ghost. Amen. And by the way, what's going on in 2 Chronicles 5? It don't matter. It does matter. <laughs> They're consecrating the temple that Solomon built under God's instruction. Yeah. God is moving from the tabernacle to the temple. And this is part of the ceremony. There'll be a whole prayer that Solomon gives in 2 Chronicles 6. Fire will come down from heaven and burn up their animal sacrifices in this consecration ceremony, making holy the temple. And we covered a couple weeks back, didn't we? The idea of a sanctuary, whether we have a holy sanctuary or not. You don't have a holy sanctuary. You don't have holy priests. These people were priests, right? And you're trying to recreate this thing that's going on here. Not a good idea, right? The glory that God is manifesting today is the glory of his grace. That's not something you see very easily. And that's actually a reason why people want to see this. They go, we want to see something. We want to feel something. Well, God gave you something more worthy than this. They did not know what God would do in Matthew, Luke, and John. They didn't know what he would do according to the revelation of the mystery. But they are doing what God said to do. And in that obedience and subjection and their praising of him, God responded to their obedience and subjection with him inhabiting the house he told them to build in which God dwelt. What does that mean today when you worship God according to his instructions and obedience and subjection? That God will inhabit where he said he would inhabit, which is you. Amen. If you get your worship right, you should be doing service right, which means God will dwell in people. <laughs> if you don't worship right, people, God won't dwell in people. They won't hear the gospel. They don't know what God did. They'll be trying to pray God down, not knowing that he's in you and you can trust the, Christ, and trust the cross for salvation. Amen. You see how important worship is and how it's related to service. It's that you got to know what God's doing to be able to worship him properly. you got to know who he is to worship him properly. Yeah. They're doing this in the temple in Jerusalem for a specific reason. Mm -hmm. But you see God's glory cloud come down here. Look at Deuteronomy. All the commands... All the law, all the prophets hung on this everlasting gospel of worshiping God. If you make it just worship, you're really diminishing the instructions of God in the Old Testament and the New as well. Deuteronomy chapter 6, 
What's the first commandment? What's the greatest commandment? You know that, right? The commandment that, of the law given to Israel, but the commandment was to love God with all their heart, mind, and soul. This is the true heart of worship, as people will indicate. Romans 6, verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. What's the heart of worship in Deuteronomy 6? It's the law of God in your heart. That's the heart of worship. You cannot obey, subject yourself, or do God's will unless you know his will, unless you know what he said to do. Then you can love God with all your heart, mind, and soul. When you know what he wants you to do, then you can do it. Deuteronomy chapter 10. If you don't communicate the will of God, people can sing praises to an unknown God not knowing his will and still not be worshiping him properly. Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 12. Now Israel, what doth the Lord thy God require of thee? But to fear the Lord thy God, to walk in all his ways, to love him, to serve the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul. That's another way to describe worship. To fear him, obey him, subject yourself to him, walk in him, know him, love him with all your heart and with all your soul. That's the law. How do you worship God under the law? By doing the law. That's how you worship God. That's what they were doing in the temple. They were simply doing what God instructed. God told them to make singers in the temple. He said that. Matthew 22, Jesus said the same thing. All the law and the prophets hang on this commandment. Love God with all your heart, mind, and soul. If you love him, you'll hear what he says. You'll subject yourself. You'll listen to what he says, and you'll do it. Well, how can I listen to God? We listen to God in, in, in our praise service. Our Listening to God is by opening his word and reading what he said. That's how you hear what, what God is yeah. saying. Look at Hebrews 10, verse 2. In Hebrews 10, it actually indicates about the sacrifices of the Old Testament, and, and it's relating to the New Testament sacrifices, but he says about the Old Testament sacrifices, then would they have ceased to be offered. He's talking about the sacrifices being offered frequently in the Old Testament because that the worshipers, once purged, should have had no more conscience of sins. Notice he uses the word worshipers here. It didn't say Israel. It didn't say the servants. It said worshipers. What are these worshipers doing? They're offering sacrifices, animal sacrifices, otherwise known as following the law. They're doing what God said. And Hebrews 10, 2 calls them worshipers. It doesn't say they're singing. No. If you take that meaning of worship and you say, what about you? How do I worship God? I don't have a good voice, right? I'm not singing songs all day long. <laughs> but you worship God by doing what he said. What did God say? Well, it's a dispensational reality, isn't it? Right? The heart of worship in Israel's law required sacrifices. It re therefore, it required a priest. It required the law of God. It required a temple. Those were essential for Israel's worship. So for people today to talk about worship, thinking it requires a sanctuary and a holy man, right? They're talking like Israel. They're missing what God's doing today under grace. The heart of worship requires right teaching. Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 4 through 8, Nehemiah stands up in a pulpit. He opens up the book of the law. He reads the book of the law to the people. The next verse says, those people, after they heard the word of the law, they bowed down and worshiped. Bowed down and worshiped. They didn't stand up and sing. They bowed down and worshiped in subjection to what they heard being read of the law. And after that, they actually did it. They started purging the things that they were doing wrong and started doing things God said to do. That's the heart of worship. Matthew chapter 15. This is why if you just make it the ex vocal expression of love out of your mouth, that doesn't get to the heart. That actually literally is lip service. Amen. You've heard that in the Bible? The idea about lip service, that's literally what that is. It's not that you should not say things to praise God. It's simply that if that's all you're doing, that's literally what lip service is. Matthew 15, verse 6. Honor not his father and mother, uh, he shall be free. Uh, thus have you made the commandment of God not effect. Jesus is talking here about people who are making the commandment of God of none effect by their tradition. Ye hypocrites, he says. Uh, well did Isaiah's the prophecy, pro, uh, Isaiah's prophesy of you, saying, This people draws nigh unto me with their mouth and honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me, but in vain they do worship me. How do they worship in vain? Is because they're singing and not meaning it? It has nothing to do with your intent. It has nothing to do with your meaning. It has to do with, look, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. How is their worship vain? They're teaching wrong things. That's what it says. The heart of worship is not simply, I am sincere. That's not what it is. You can sincerely say things by your lips. I sincerely say I love you. Show it. I sincerely said it. I mean it. I really do. You ever had a liar say that to you? I mean it. Really. 
We haven't shown it again and again and again and again. Yeah. The heart is teaching truth, doing what God says to, 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 uh, to teach the doctrines of God, not the commandments of men. It requires teaching. Look at John 4. One of the most popular passages on worship in the New Testament is John 4. Remember that? Jesus meets the Samaritan woman. Ten times the word worship is used in this context, describing what kind of worship God wants and what he will want. This, of course, is Jesus operating under Israel's law system here, but nonetheless, John 4, verse 20. We'll, we'll back up and read this. <clears throat> the woman perceived Jesus that he was a prophet and said, Our fathers worshipped in this mountain as a Samaritan. Ye say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. You know, these days people don't even care where they worship. As long as it's in the house of God. <laughs> what is that? Well, you're the temple today. There is no house of God outside of you. Verse 21, Jesus said unto, unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour comes when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship, ye know not what. You see that? Jesus himself said, it's important for you to know who and what you're worshiping. Yes. How can you be subject to the God's will if you don't know God's will? Now, again, I'm not, I'm not condemning you if you don't. I'm simply saying you cannot move to step two in worshiping God unless you first know step one, the will of God, and knowing how to do it. Amen. We should want to worship God. That means we should need to know what God is doing. And so many confused Christians don't know what he's doing. I think they can still worship God when they don't know what. That's what the Samaritans were doing. They were worshiping God, and Jesus said, you don't know what you're worshiping. That's it. Wow. It's not a vain worship being offered there. You know, we know, Jesus says, we know what we worship for salvation is of the Jews. What? <laughs> These are words Jesus never said in any television program about Jesus' life. He didn't say this there either. Not the chosen, nothing like that. He never said salvation is of the Jews, except for the Bible, where he actually did. Right, salvation is of the Jews. But what does salvation have to do with worship, really? You don't know what you worship. Salvation is of the Jews. Well, can't someone worship God in the sincerity of their heart, even when they don't understand all the details? Jesus says you got to know something to be able to worship God. You can praise God all you want, right? Heathens praise God's. <laughs> they don't know who they're praising. They, they know that God's above me, and so they praise the God of heaven and earth. And you tell them, you know, the God sent his son Jesus. You go, huh? And they believe that or not. Now they can worship God in truth. They worship God in the reality of the Spirit and not with the works of their hands. Jesus says the hour comes, and now is, and the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father seeks such to worship him. And from that verse, many people interpret that the word truth, of course, that's reality. Jesus is God and things like that. But the word spirit, they read as passion and emotion. And that's not what that word means. Spirit and truth is in contrast to your flesh and lies. That's what that is. The Father seeks those who worship him with your spirit and truth, not in your flesh and lies. And emotions actually lie in your flesh, and they can easily lie to you, so be careful. He says, God is spirit. They that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. Go over to Philippians 3, verse 3. Paul mentions a similar subject in this idea of worship. The reason why you see Jesus here saying something similar to Paul is because worship is a big subject. It's like serving God or believing God. That's how worshiping God is. So it means the same. You serve God, you believe God. That's true in every page of the Bible. What you believe about him, how you serve him, that changes in the Bible dispensationally. And thus, how you worship him changes. But Philippians chapter 3, Paul says this. <clears throat> we are the circumcision. Whew, that'll drive you right, divider crazy, right? He's talking here about true circumcision in their flesh, convincing the Philippians to obey the law. And he's saying, beware of those dogs in verse 2. He says, we are the circumcision, talking about Gentiles, we are the circumcision, which worship God in the spirit. Amen. You know what Jesus was talking about? The Father desires people worship him in spirit and truth. Yeah. Paul defines what it means. Mm -hmm. We worship him in spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh which everyone that can't carry a tune says, amen. Because, you know, it's like, that's flesh, folks. Flesh is like, I have a great voice. That's flesh. Flesh is, it sounds really pretty. That's flesh. Paul says, we have no confidence in flesh. What's that mean? I worship God in spirit. That's what that means. Well, how can you do that? 
How can you worship God without an actual performance? Because it's by grace. Because I worship God through Jesus Christ. Because I know the truth that he died for my sins. It's by his grace that I praise God for saving me. Not by my works, by my singing and my praising to him. By his work. That's how you worship God today. So we try to sing in tune the song Amazing Grace, you know. Thank God it's not about the song or the singing of it. It's about the truth behind it. It's the thing that you believe and hold to and live by, which is God's grace. This changes worship. This is much deeper than simply a time of music together. Ephesians 1.13, Paul says, When you heard the gospel of your salvation, the word of truth, there's truth, you received the seal of the Holy Spirit. The seal of the Holy Spirit sealed you, right? So you have the Holy Spirit, you have truth, the gospel of your salvation, and the Spirit dwelling in you is the temple of God. Amen. You can only worship God if the Spirit's in you. You can only worship God if you have salvation and you know truly what that is. Amen. Otherwise, you're not worshiping God. Unsaved Christians can't worship God. Amen. Don't say that, Justin. They're trying real hard. They're not saved. Only in the sense that the devils, who also aren't saved, subject themselves to the Son of God can those who don't know the gospel, the grace of God, still subject themselves to a holy, righteous God, not knowing that they're saved by his finished work, not what they do. Have you seen that? Have you seen people sincerely try to subject themselves to God, thinking their subjection to him is what makes them Christian? That their doing service to God is what makes them Christian. What's the truth that you know, spirit and truth today? It's not what you do, it's what Christ did. Amen. Right? And if you know that, then you can worship him in truth, worship him in spirit. This is what we need to communicate with people. This is what we need to mention. What the church should be communicating. But this requires us stop singing for a moment and look at the Bible longer than 10 minutes. Right? It's taken a while here. Worship is not the most excellent service and performance you can give. It is the service to the most excellent one. And that's what the Old Testament of the law taught us. It taught us who Jesus was, who God was, and who that was. Now, then we turn to church service today, where Paul says in Acts 17, hopefully by this point when I say church service, you're hearing worship in your head. That's why I put that. It's not music. It's church service. It's what worship is. Well, how does the church supposed to serve God today? How are we supposed to worship God today? Acts 17, 24, 25, Paul says to the Gentiles, who he's trying to minister salvation to, he says, God is not worshipped with temples made by men's hands. He's not worshipped at all with men's hands. This is the praise position of the most devout. This is the praise position of the less devout. This is the praise position of introverts like me. You know? <laughs> but hands, these are hands, okay? God's not worshipped with men's hands. Like, what does that mean if it doesn't apply to everyone raising their hands to God? No, I, it's not wrong to raise your hands. It's not against the law or something. But if you think that is your worship, that may be what your arms want to do when you feel love for God, but it's like you can't say, I'm worshiping him. You know, it's like you can't say that. He's not worshiping with men's hands. Yeah. Acts 24, 14 and 15, he actually uses the word worship when talking about what he, he teaches. Look at Acts 24. He's being persecuted by the Jews uh, for, from Israel, unbelieving Israel, for what he's teaching about Jesus, and his resurrection, and the gospel of grace, more specifically. But in Acts 24, he makes this confession in court, but it does not destroy his case. He says, This I confess unto thee, that after the way which they call heresy, so worship I, the God of my fathers. They're accusing Paul of worshiping God in heresy, which is blasphemy. Right? It's like we saw with the Antichrist. When you do worship wrong, it's blasphemy. And he says, they're saying I'm committing heresy and blasphemy. And I confess, the way they say that I worship God is how I do it, believing all things which are written in the law and the prophets. What, what is he talking about? They were blaming him for blasphemy by saying Jesus was the son of God and that he rose from the dead and that men could be saved by what he did. That's what they were blaming him. That's blasphemy, they said. And Paul says, I confess. I worship the God of my fathers, teaching Jesus rose from the dead, and he saves me by his resurrection. In fact, he says in verse 15, or 15, I have hope toward God, which they themselves also allow, that there shall be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and the unjust. And herein do I exercise myself, to have always a conscious void of offense toward God and toward men. He says, I'm doing what God said. Amen. So by confessing their heresy, he's actually condemning them, as he's saying what their own law and prophets say they're not doing. 
I'm not the one worshiping wrongly. They're the ones worshiping wrongly. Right? But what's it dependent on is my point in the verse here. It's dependent on knowing something about Jesus and the gospel and what he's doing. Amen. Right? You could, Paul couldn't have said that 30 years prior. He didn't know it. Jesus hadn't come. Worship, at one point, under the law, expressed, was expressed by how men performed. God told Israel, go to the temple, offer sacrifices. Here's the priest, do it this way. Sing praises to God, offer the incense, have, make the environment, make the holy smell we covered last week, right? It, worship to God was once expressed by how we performed. And that was necessary to teach us that God is worth all of what we have, yeah. right? One day a week, you have this holy Sabbath day that you're supposed to keep. He says, take your oxen and burn it up. You ever wonder why burnt offerings were a thing? It's like, it, some offerings they would offer and the priest would eat. So like, oh, that makes sense. So they give it up, but the priest get to eat. That's good. It's practical. But you take an ox, you take it to the priest, and the priest goes, all right, there's the match. And you're going, what? And the, it, that, 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 I raised that cow. You know? It's like, he's big and fat. In fact, he's the fattest one. That's what the law required. And he's, you burn him up? Like, no one gets to benefit from this. God said to do it. That testified that God is worth what you value most. Amen. That's what it's supposed to communicate. So you offered burnt offerings as worship to God because, man, I'm going to miss this cow on my bottom line revenue sheet this year. But there you go. Burn it up because God told me to do it, and he's worth it. Yeah. Right? Abraham offered his son because God was worth it. Yeah. So it once was expressed by how men performed what we gave God, and that showed his worth, because as the more we gave God, or people, Israel, gave God, the more it showed how valuable God was. Yeah. It must be pretty valuable to give up all that, right? And that does teach something about God's holiness, as the law would do. But what if everything a sinner could give up to God did not show his true value and worth? What if everything you had in your whole life, if offered up to God, it'd be like a little kid giving you crumbs off his table? My son does that, and I love this, this time of life. And my son, he's drawing pictures and things now. And, you know, he's growing in his artistic ability. That's the nice way to say it, right? And, uh, but he'll give you a little picture or something like that, and you're going, and you love it because you love your son. You love it. You're like, ah, oh, wonderful. It's a circle with two dots and a line on it, you know. But it's like nothing. It's like, you know, nothing. Don't tell him. It's like, you know, it's a small thing. You know, it's not Mona Lisa, right? It doesn't show my worth, the quality of this picture. I don't think maybe it does. I don't know. But... <laughs> The point is, this is how God, this is how sinners relate to God. All, everything a sinner can offer up to God, your whole life, everything you've achieved in this world, all the kings of this world offered up to God, it's not his worth. No. He's worth more. So if the law system of worship, God put in place on purpose to show his worth by telling people to offer up what you have, which is a valuable lesson for worship, what if sinners couldn't do that? Then how do we know his true worth? God himself puts on flesh. He himself dies for our sins. He himself does things that no man could ever do, offers things to you that you could never earn, gives you things you could never deserve. That shows his worth higher than anything you could ever give him. Amen. We call that grace. So, and that's what God's revealed today. He's revealed all these things he's done for you abundantly so that we worship God, not by what we give him anymore, even though that's wor he's worthy of everything I have, but he doesn't want it. He's worthy of every good work that you should do to a holy God, but he doesn't want that from you to be saved. He, doesn't want, he wants Jesus Christ and you to trust him. He wants faith, right? How do you worship God? Walking by faith, believing the gospel by faith. Worship is now expressed by Jesus Christ and his work to God. You say, well, that's what he did, not what I do. Are you saying I can't do worship? You need to acknowledge what he did. That's your worship. That's showing his greater value. Whenever someone says, well, you show me your faith, but without your works, I'll show you my faith by my works. You say, well, I'll show you the work of Christ. How about that? He did more, anything that, he did more than anything anybody can do. Yeah. Right? That's a greater value. The Old Testament showed God's worth in creation, in a nation. He used the creation to show his powers. Do you really think God's power stopped at being able to turn a river into blood? You think God's power stopped at the ability to split the waters? He created heaven and earth. That's nothing. You think God's power stopped with giving people daily bread? No. It did show God's power, though. But he's much greater than that. What's the greatest thing God ever did? He died on the cross for humanity. He saved sinners, which is impossible without his shed blood. That's the commendation of his love, which is much greater than anything that we can do in love and response. 
The New Testament showed God's worth in his sacrifice, as Jesus himself died as a sacrifice for Israel and for the world. And that's a worthy thing. Sacrifice became worthy. Your own sacrifice. But then now, in God's grace, we see God's worth because of the extent, the endless extent of his abundant grace. Amen. That's where worship is found. So when we talk about church service, it's misidentified because it's not this meeting. It's not simply what we're doing here. It's not just this. It's, it's because you are the church. And what we're doing here is preparing each other to serve God yes. by giving us knowledge of truth, by encouraging one another to have the right heart regarding serving God, right? We do that so that when we live our life in whatever we do, in whatsoever we do, we do it to the glory of God, yes. right? In everything we do, we do it giving thanks to God, Colossians 317. That doesn't stop here. So th that's how that works. The law taught, don't just be a Sunday Christian. Grace says, we're going to change your heart with what God's done for you so that you don't know any other way to live. Amen. Right? That's what grace does. It changes you from the inside out. Look at Romans 12, verse 1 and 2, and see this verse maybe in a new light. Because Romans 12, Paul talks about worship. People don't read it that way, though. Romans 12, 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies. Bodies. That's your bodies. Your mortal flesh, right? A living sacrifice. That's only possible if you're dead and yet alive. That's yeah. Christ in you. Amen. Holy, acceptable unto God. Well, that kind of sounds like an appeal to the Old Testament sacrifices, right? But here's the problem. You're not actually holy. Only God is. Holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Do you see that phrase, reasonable service? That's worship, folks. Worship is your reasonable service to God. And Romans 12, 2 says, Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. This whole concept here of doing the perfect will of God in verse 2 is because he already taught what that was in Romans 1 through 8. Once you learn the mind of Christ, how to walk into the Spirit, Romans 1 through 8, then you're ready to do your reasonable service. If you don't know Romans 1 through 8 and the doctrines taught about your salvation, who you are in Christ, and how to walk, you can't serve reasonably. You can't worship reasonably. You can't do the will of God. By Romans 12, that's the instruction. Okay? Worship is done in the spirit and not the flesh. Romans 8 teaches us that. We'll cover that on Tuesday. Worship, as Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, is the will of God constraining us by the love of Christ. What motivates us to, to operate and do good things in this dispensation? Not the law. It's not our flesh. It says in 2 Corinthians 5, the love of Christ constrains us. Amen. You know, the Bible says to be charitable one to another. And charity is a chief component of grace living, as, as we've studied and learned over, over the weeks and years. But, you know, you can't be charitable to God. Charity is you serving others with the knowledge of the truth to help them benefit, help the truth benefit them, right? So when you serve other people to see the truth benefit them, that's you being charitable. Right? But you can't be charitable to God because he doesn't need help with the truth. He is the truth. Another way to describe charity is that you're serving people who are unworthy. They're inferior to truth. They need help. They're broken. You too, right? You're in the same place. So charity is you serving people with the truth to benefit them because they're not worthy of assistance, so you do it charitably. You do it out of grace, right? But worship is serving God because he is worthy. Amen. So charity is serving people because they're not. Worship is serving God because he is. That's the difference. But you're both trying to serve in truth other people. And so we then study what our God-given ministry is. Well, it's to be stewards of the mysteries God's entrusted us. It's to show yourself approved unto people, right? Unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, which is one half of how you worship God. Amen. Truth. The spirit is not having confidence in your flesh. So you rightly dividing the word of truth is actually helping you worship. You walking by the knowledge of that truth is you worshiping God in spirit and truth. So worship today, speaking of tabernacles, you hear people sing songs in worship services as musical services they have about the tabernacles of God in your holy temple and in your courts. You know, one day in your courts. And it's like you're in the body of Christ. Amen. At one time, that was how worship was expressed. But now, that's missing the truth of God and his dispensation. When worship becomes your performance, you miss the worth of God's grace because your performance can't, can't match it. It can never reach it, okay? And so, and so now, as Colossians 3, Colossians 3, 16 talks about music. It's not the only thing it talks about, though. It says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. 
The emphasis is on verse 16 is on the word of Christ, the teaching, the doctrine. Dwell in you richly in all wisdom. How do we do that? One way to do that is by teaching and admonishing one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. And in case you're wondering what the similarity or differences are between those three things, psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, is they all have to do with words. Instrumentation music is just fine. It's just music, right? But psalms, you have them written in the Bible. It's a form of singing words to musical instruments. Hymns have to do with the orientation of your words toward God and not toward persons and people. And then spiritual songs have to do with songs not about fleshly things. I want to rock your body. Like, well, that's pretty fleshly. Spiritual song would be, I am the body. You know? yeah. Yep, that's spiritual. So it's the content of the song. So all three of those things have to do with the words of Christ dwelling in you. Amen. Which means it's not how you sing or the sound of the music. It's what you're singing and it's what you're believing and it's how you're serving. Mm -hmm. That's worship. So we do that all to the glory of God. Any, any questions or comments about... Worship.